in the lecture asa. I'm going to be recording as I do it, then I'm going to post it on my site. I'll, I'll show you how to get to it when we're done with the lecture. I got a couple of the lectures we've done over the last year, year and a half. They're posted so people who missed it today, you can still refer to them and get a chance to see it. So uh, we're going to be talking about blunt chest trauma. And it's based on a clinical case we had here in the emergency department. It was a young male patient. It was very early in the morning. We're having the easiest night in the ER that you know, doesn't happen often. But it was probably like 3 in the morning. The ER board was clear. Maybe we had one, maybe two patients in the ER at that time. And they called us because there was a multiple car pileup. They were bringing up some very sick people. One of them was severely injured. I thought they were pulling my leg at first, obviously. And uh, they said, nope, we're coming for you. Um, and the first patient was going to be uh, this young man. He was the driver of the vehicle, kind of piled up on I-75, had uh, obvious chest trauma. And uh, at the time, he was still breathing. Um, I guess while it got him extricated, he lost pulses. And of course, CPR started. Uh, so traumatic arrest was the call. And also told there was multiple other victims also coming to the emergency department. So um, we had to gear up, get ready. Um, and here we're going to talk initially, based on the case, on what things to expect, what to get ready for, uh, for this kind of case. And then we're going to talk about what we actually did on the case, so put it all in context. First, I want to watch this video that I have posted here. Um, it's a movie called Code Black. You can find it on the internet. And It's not going to be very loud, but you'll get the point. This is based out of UCLA, I believe, County Hospital in California. It's a very good movie that uh, basically is a documentary on the pathway of emergency medicine residents as they transition from County Hospital in one place to the next one. This here is what they call C booth. Nobody really knows why they call it C booth. But it was probably the first place of emergency medicine. Uh, the very first ER resident trained in that emergency department. My biggest impact when I saw this in this video is people are going to think about this. This is not in emergency medicine. It's not how it's practiced. I mean, you can see people, you know, wearing a lousy uh, PEP. Definitely not a scale. The doctor, the doctor, the doctor, I see no space. Twenty people around. Team here, trying to take them together, together to save someone's life. Uh, uh, chest you can see that they're trying to perform okay. a knee for a cardiac. Here's just no space for the other doctor to put a chest on the other side. One cool thing they said during the documentary was more people have died in that square foot area than any other place in the United States, but at the same time, more, more people have been saved in that square foot area than any other place in the United States. This is in uh, California, County Hospital. I think it's UCLA. Who are the doctors here? Who are the nurses? 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 It was put out, I think, a year ago. You can find it on the internet of the video. Um, it's called Code Black. And Code Black actually is not the fact that it's Code Black and everybody shows up. But it's just the other time. All right, so we started talking about it. We were talking about a blunt chest trauma, and by far the most important cause of the significant blunt chest trauma comes from motor vehicle collisions. Of course, you guys are the ones who initially see these patients bring to us. 70 to 80 percent of all major blunt chest trauma comes from motor vehicle collisions. Looking at a picture of the chest, you can see all the structures that are involved from the chest, you know. You have, obviously, your heart, major vessels, you got your lungs, 
you got your diaphragm, um, you got um, airway, so, so the trachea itself, the bronca can get injured, the esophagus, of course, spine, and um, all the structures. And we're going to talk up, so, uh, about them. So when somebody comes in with blunt chest trauma, the, the main thing is what do you expect? What sort of things should you start being suspicious of? And then we're going to talk about the injuries as we go through, maybe from less severe to more severe and so on. So we got sternal fractures and rib fractures, so just bony fractures and the implications of those fractures. But then the worst case scenario of fractures is the flail chest, where you got multiple uh, fractures. Um, then we're going to talk about pneumo and hemothorax. Uh, we're going to talk about pulmonary and cardiac contusions. We're going to talk about cardiac tamponade and ultimately about traumatic aortic dissection. And then put it into context of this patient that we saw. A sternal fracture is just that, a fracture of the sternum. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see a, a, an x-ray show not only a fracture, but it's actually a fracture displacement. To displace a fracture segment like that, obviously, force of injury, mechanism of injury. This is high risk for other stuff. When it's a non-displaced crack, then less likely to have other things. But there's really not much to talk about that. It's if they're tender in the sternum, you have to suspect about it. Um, does it matter to the clinician? They have a bruise of their chest. You feel their sternum. It hurts to touch. It really matters the complication, not so much the sternal fraction. Now, the one on the right really matters because that probably needs some kind of intervention. It needs to be put to back together, maybe a uh, wire stitch or something like that. Um, but in terms of diagnosis, the suspicion if they're tender and uh, appropriate films, so on. Rift fractures are just that, broken ribs. And uh, most of the time, rift fractures don't really matter if the patient's stable, if the patient's well and healthy. You have one or two rib fractures, no big deal. If the fracture is significantly displaced, obviously that's going to create more pain, more functional deficit, complications like to displace a rib fracture, then you get things like um, when that fracture happened, whether or not it punctured the lung, whether or not it bruised the lung, uh, and of course the pain associated with it will diminish that patient's ability to take a deep breath, therefore complications would develop, like atelectasis, this is when the little um, sacs of air start collapsing and retaining mucus, uh, and then of course atelectasis is not treated, if the patient is not breathing deep enough, ultimately leads into pneumonia. Here in this x-ray, on the right hand side, there are multiple rift fractures, continuous rift fractures, one, two, three, four, maybe five, and you can see from it that because the bone actually looks more dense where the fracture is, that it's overlapping, and you can see that these two are not even touching. So that's a more risky form of a rib fracture than you would get with somebody, a 20-year-old who fell on his side, has a couple rib fractures that are non-displaced. Obviously, these are displaced, so you've got to suspect that displacement may be led to, if you can't see it on the x-ray, a pneumothorax, a hemothorax, a pulmonary contusion, and so on. Um, and then, of course, the flail chest. There are different definitions, and if you read different books, different places in the internet, you're gonna find different things. The bottom line is that there's a physiologic definition that probably uh, gathers all of the other definitions. If the fracture segment moves paradoxically with the chest wall, means that there is a flail segment there. Paradoxical means when you do an inspiration, the chest actually expands in the open so in order to pull the air in. So when you have a flail segment, instead of coming out with the chest, it goes in because it's being sucked in. So the most common definition I've found is two ribs on two places. So in other words, you build a little square, so that square goes in. So it could be more than that, but it needs at least two. But I found another definition that is more than three continuous fractures can also create a, a fragment, uh, a flail chest, especially if it's in the uh, lower uh, ribs like this because ultimately they float in the anterior part of the chest. So if it's broken just in one place, that could also lead to a flail segment there because there's nothing else attached to it. A lot of things I tell the patients is when they come in for, I think I have a rib fracture, is that I'm not really going to be looking at the chest x-ray for the rib fracture. It really doesn't matter to me. I'm looking for a pneumothorax, I'm looking for a hemothorax, I'm looking for a pulmonary contusion, I'm looking for free fluid. Other injuries, obviously a, a lower rib fracture, internal organ injury, so if it's on the right you think liver injury, on the left you think spleen injury, and so on. 
What is happening? Well, we talked about that the paradoxical movement of the flail segment with inspiration supposed to go out, the flail segment goes in. A flail chest is identified as paradoxical movement of the segment of the chest wall. And uh, we already explained that. And here's a cool video of a couple patients with flail chest. You see, with inspiration, that's when So the important thing about a flail chest is not just, you know, identifying it, obviously, is that it's going to create some problems in terms of the mechanism of respiration and therefore complications. So this patient often needs to be ventilated, you know, intubated, not only because it'll expand the lung completely, maybe pushing those segments back into anatomical position, but also because that segment go, going in like that, it probably bruised the lung, they have pulmonary contusions, all the problems are going to deteriorate, uh, deoxygenate, and so on. So, such things. Uh, the death rate for patients with flail chest, it depends, of course, on the severity of injuries, the underlying injuries, but it's about 10 to 25 percent. Um, this actually demonstrates one of those complications we're talking about. Anybody wants to give it a shot? So just uh, whenever you look at x-rays in general, look at symmetry. Left and right should pretty much look the same. <coughs> so you look at the left chest compared to the right chest, the right chest looks really dark. Air looks dark on an x-ray because um, uh, the, all the x-ray beams go through, it's stopped by nothing, so it makes it look dark. The darker, the more x-ray penetrated the film. On the, for example, the heart is very dense, X-ray rays don't <coughs> penetrate so much, it looks whiter. And bone looks the whitest because almost nothing goes through, right? So on the right-hand side, there's almost um, all the X-ray beams are going through and essentially it's a big, big heat uh, pneumothorax. So all this is air, you don't see any lung markings. See how bone looks like a fluffy cotton candy, if you will. And then here, you don't see that anywhere here except here, so lung is all collapsing to this area right here. So that's a, a massive, a pneumothorax. So, is it a tension pneumothorax? Anybody wants to give me a quick answer? Answer yes. Okay, what else? Almost always the answer is depends. You can never look, go wrong if you say depends in medicine at all. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> like, like, you know, you got to tell me the real uh, answer to that question is what are the patient's vital signs? It doesn't matter how big the pneumothorax is. It could be 10%, 20%, 100% pneumothorax. If their vital signs are normal, it's not a tension pneumothorax, period. You have to be hypertensive, tachycardic, unstable. So, so it could be 10%, and if they are tachycardic and hypertensive, it is a tension pneumo, you treat it like so. The other thing is, could you imply that it's a tension? Yeah, the tracheal deviation, you know, complete collapse, so probably a tension pneumo, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, a lot of people have only one lung, and that's full of, you know, a, a, a person with a complete lung being pulled out because of cancer, and, and nothing's moving. It's not a tension just because it's not there. Um, so that's pneumothorax, and we talked about that. Um, here, uh, this shows another potential complication, and I've already been mentioning. Anybody wants to give it a shot what we're looking at here? A hemothorax, okay? So uh, there's a whole bunch of fluids making the X-ray beam stopping it and making it look white. So it's a right-sided hemothorax. How about this one? So both. You have a hemopneumothorax. So hemo, because you got the white part, uh, with the very sharp demarcated, that's what gives it. Some, when it's just hemothorax, it's kind of like, like a wave, you know, it's not that discreet. But when it's a hemonumo, it's very flat because the air is pushing that uh, water straight, and then you get that hemonumothorax. Um, let's see. B 
before I play that, obviously uh, the treatment is going to depend. Is the patient stable, not stable? Is the patient stable with a pneumothorax, with a hemothorax, with a hemonumothorax? Then you clean up, you set up, you do moment of safety, you sedate the patient, and then you do a chest tube. You have all the time in the world. I'm going to talk about that. But if they're unstable, if they just lost vitals, if they were breathing and all of a sudden they're not, and you suspect one of these, you should do needle decompression. Of course, I don't need to teach you how to do it, but I do want to show you one of them being done. Because we're not a trauma center, we don't do it often, and we forget how to do it. And when we need to, we don't feel as confident uh, to do it. There is nothing to it. You're going to take the largest IV needle you have, um, 18 or bigger, you're going to go right in the middle of the clavicles underneath it, and you're going to wipe an alcohol swab, and you're going to it that is all you need to do. Um, the problem is once you do that, if they didn't have it now, they'll have a pneumothorax, and they will have to put a chest tube. So what? If this patient's unstable and you suspect it, do it. That's what they do in trauma centers all the time, especially if they lost pulses. Just go ahead and, and do a, a needle decompression, and we'll have to put a chest tube when they show up. So here is a video. This is actually me doing a chest tube, and it's a little, just a two-minute video. Um, of course, this is for a, a pneumothorax, and it's not stable, so it's sterile, it's, you know, slow, it's nothing like urgency. You do it at the nipple line, just underneath the nipple line, you do the right anterior axillary line, and you go, you fill the rib, and you go right above the rib. Uh, underneath the rib, you got our arteries, veins, and nerves. So you go underneath and you nick the skin there. It's going to create a lot of bleeding and stuff. Of course, in a setting of emergency, you just mm -hmm. cut them, put a chest tube in, that's it. If you have the time in the world, you try to dissect, starting from the top of the rib up, right from the bottom of that rib. So you saw me do a very tiny incision. This is a, a stable pneumothorax. If some emergency, you want to limit the scar. And we're going to use a very, very small trocar. It used to be we put these big chest tubes in. Now they have these little tiny straws, basically. And they're uh, trocar based. So I have to do very little dissection. Actually, they don't even recommend dissection at all. They just use the tube, it has the trocar inside, just push it in in one single movement. But you know what? When you don't do both two or three a year, I take my time. I do a little dissection, I feel my spot. So what I'm doing there is actually right there when it did that click is penetrating the pleura. Um, there. So, so I'm going through muscle. So I first the incision of the skin, dissection through muscle until you feel like you're in the intercostal muscles. And then you put that pressure with that forcep until you go into that cave space. Now I'm opening that space to make sure that I can find it later. So when I go with the choker, I can push it. So I don't like to take it up because I take my forces up, then I lose my spot and you can end up doing a second hole and of course it's going to be more painful to the patient if he recovers and stuff. You can see my uh, chest, it's very, very small. It's a very small uh, chest with a choker and then you push it in. And the first thing you're going to should see is condensation in the tube. You know, obviously when you come to the flare, if it's a big movement, you're going to feel a gush of air. Uh, but in this scenario, uh, I think there was a little bit, and then here you're going to see the, the condensation of the chest to kind of confirm that you're in the right spot. Once you're done with that, then this is a, a, a non-emergent chest tube, is to, you know, put it in place, suture in place so it doesn't move, hook it up to suction, etc. This is another x-ray of one of those other complications we talk about. So remember, we've talked already about uh, fractures fractured ribs, fractured sternum, uh, and the complications of the tissues underneath, um, pneumothorax, hemothorax, hemonumothorax. Anybody wants to take a, a shot of what that is? So by deceleration of those ribs coming to quick contact with the pulmonary tissue, you have what is called pulmonary contusion. This is huge pulmonary contusion. It's kind of everywhere. Usually you'll see small spots of fluxing like pneumonia. So remember what I said before. A chest x-ray should look dark. The lung tissue should look dark because a lot of x-ray beams are going through. And here those x-ray beams are getting stopped by all this fluffy cotton candy everywhere. And that is either blood or edema in the alveoli. That's what a pulmonary contusion is. 
It's an injury to the lung parenchyma leading to edema or blood in the collecting in the alveolar spaces and loss of normal lung structure and function. So these patients will get complications like uh, hypoxia spells, atelectasis, pneumonia, and so on. This is uh, a picture of a CT scan showing uh, pulmonary contusions. So obviously somebody who you can see a pulmonary contusion on an x-ray, go ahead and scan them because that puts you at a high risk for other complications. So you're not only going to see the contusion, but you see all the things you might have missed, like a non-displaced rib fracture, like um, heart issues or major vessel rupture, something like that. So pulmonary contusions can result immediately. I mean, you see them and you do the x-ray 30 minutes later when you're evaluating, you already see them. But just because you don't see them doesn't mean you don't have them. Uh, so it can take up to 24 hours to develop. So the patient's having a lot of pain with inspiration. They have multiple other injuries. Watch them observe, and they can start dropping their oxygen and so on. And ultimately, multiple uh, diffuse pulmonary conditions can lead to ARDS, acute respiratory stress syndrome, in up to 50 to 60% of patients with multiple um, contusions. This is um, uh, same patient on admission 24 hours later. So you could already see it on admission. On the left side, you saw that kind of candy kind of thing compared to the right, okay? So we've been showing you that in different x-rays. But you can see the left looks so much worse. So um, kind of like when we're dealing with patient complaints and they call, how could they have missed this? You know, they sent me home with this huge pulmonary condition. Well, he wasn't like that when we saw, you know? Some things take time. Uh, burns, for example, I've learned that if it's a first degree, it'll probably be a second degree tomorrow. If it's a second, it's a, probably a third, because things evolve over time. So if you have that clinical suspicion, if the mechanism <laughs> is right, then either do a better diagnosis test, uh, a, a different kind of imaging, or keep them for observation. And this is that IRDS on that picture with the most, it kind of looks like that's multiple pulmonary contusions. Um, but this is much more developed, and you can already see this patient's intubated, has the endotracheal tube over there in the top. Aha! Uh -huh. So pulmonary contusions and then cardiac contusions. Of course, we know the mechanisms, and I picture by F. Netter here. So <coughs> hitting right on the anterior chest, maybe a sternal mm -hmm. fracture, uh, maybe some rib fractures, and then this patient here with a big bruise across their chest. So just suspicion that there is. So how can you make that diagnosis? Well, suspicion. You can do EKGs. The EKG findings are going to be all over the place. Most common is just non-specific changes, ST segment changes, some ST depression, some T wave changes. But it can be as much as ST segment elevation. I mean, you can uh, rupture a coronary artery. You can create a vasospasm of that artery, creating ischemia tissue. So the laboratory diagnosis of pulmonary contusion includes CK troponins and things like that, just like you would do in a cardiac patient. So if somebody comes in with a big seatbelt across their chest, this is why we do an EKG and a chest x-ray and we do cardiac enzymes as well, kind of looking at that. And then echocardiogram. You can see che um, cardiac muscle wall abnormalities in terms of the movement, areas that are not pumping like they should. And sometimes you can pick up on this thing over here. Anybody wants to tell me what that red arrow points to? And it's kind of one we're going to lead to one of the other companies. Pericardial sac, it should have very little fluid. You shouldn't be able to see that in terms of fluid looks black on an ultrasound. That's a pericardial effusion. Now, is it a pericardial tamponade? Anybody wants to tell me the answer? Yes. Depends. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. You can have a huge effusion and it's not a tamponade. People can create effusions because of cirrhosis and cardiac failure and other things over months and have 200 cc's of fluids and not have a tamponade. A tamponade will be defined by 20 cc of fluids, and it's causing hypertension, then it is a tamponade. I, I guess I didn't transition to the next thing I wanted to say, but the other thing here on the x-ray is uh, when you look at an x-ray and it looks abnormal, it probably is abnormal. And, and then the, the, there's a saying that, if it looks wide, then it is wide, and I have a slide to show that. So these were shown the mediastinum. The mediastinum is the medium part of that x-ray, where all the major structures are, you got heart, aorta, uh, and the aortic knob. So this thing right here, uh, the AP, the diameter, should look like six centimeters on an upright, meaning somebody who's sitting up in bed, 
Eight centimeters is laying down because things kind of collapse a little bit. So um, if it's anything more than six centimeters or eight centimeters when they lay flat on an x-ray, then that is wide. And that gives you, okay, probably a arthritis dissection and probably something wrong with the mediastinum of that patient and so on. So this is what it called a wide mediastinum. And this one, you, you don't need to measure it, right? You don't need to get a measurement tape. If it looks big, then it is big. And that's what she said. <laughs> I just, I had to do. So when you see that on an x-ray, then you have to suspect a thoracic dissection, a traumatic thoracic dissection. I mean, imagine the mechanism to, you know, decelerating on your sternum, on your heart, that big bruise across your chest. Patients complain of back pain more than anything else. This is a, I love this kind of image. This is a CT reconstructions, and then they put color on it and stuff. But you can see right here, with this amazing line right here in the middle. That's a thoracic dissection of the descending aorta. Uh, so thoracic dissection, if they're medical, they don't always need surgery. That's something that scares the bejesus out of our nurses. Well, but it's a dissection. Why aren't we flying? And why aren't we doing this? Well, uh, a lot of dissections are medical. They're chronic hypertensives, and there's really nothing to do except control the blood pressure and stuff. But if it's traumatic, then it's going to be surgical, uh, most likely. And of course, high, high degree of mortality and morbidity with something like this. Here's an x-ray. So we talk about that wide media sound. That was the top part of the x-ray being wide. But here is the bottom part of that x-ray being wide. Anybody wants to give a shot at what I'm looking at here? A big globose heart. So this is a big, big pericardial effusion. Probably from blood if it's traumatic. If this might have been a medical patient necessarily. So I, this is just an x-ray showing a big heart from a big pericardial effusion. Um, if it's traumatic, then you think pericardial blood. And then, of course, if they have abnormalities in vital signs, then pericardial tamponade. Here's a cool because they kind of draw it. So, so you can see the bigger shadow of the heart, but the actual heart is kind of dancing within it. And then a, a, a diagram picture drawing of that blood layering in that sac. This is an EKG of a patient with that big heart and the heart floating in it. We see something that is really, really cool. Anybody wants to give it a shot at it? You don't even have to tell me what it's called. Just what impresses you about the EKG? It's the uh, bigemia valve tied to the heart wave. OK, it's, you're, you're very close to the answer there, Mike. It's not really bigemia. You would think so. It's, it's different uh, heights of the QRS. So it's actually called electrical alternance. Every other beat is alternating. And this is because the heart is floating inside that pericardium. So when it beats closer, it gives you a big QRS wave. When it beats farther away, it gives you a smaller one. So it alternates. So it's called electrical alternance. But the more common finding you're going to find for a pericardial tamponade, it's not that beautiful finding, but it's actually this low voltage QRSs because the heart's far away, there's fluid between it, so an, an EKG works by capturing electricity from the heart and making deflection because it's farther away and full of fluid in between. Those waves are very small. And then you do an echocardiogram, and like we pointed out before, this is an obvious uh, big pericardial effusion. So you have the heart, you can see the four chambers, atrium's ventricles, and you can see the fluid is black around the heart. Now, does it raise the chance of an embolus because it's changing the physical structure of the heart as well? So it you may get like regurg would you get like regurgitation? Embolus of uh, like a PE? Yeah. Um, well, that blood is in the sac, so not not exactly. The, because the heart is now pumping limited, that blood is not moving as you know. Then yes, yeah, so there could be some blood clotting inside the heart. That's so what that I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. But the blood from the pericardium wouldn't make its way back into the heart. I don't think, but again, it depends, right? So how do you do this? So, so a pericardiocentesis will be the treatment if you need to, to get this fluid right away. And essentially, you take a big needle, a big, not only in size, but a long needle, and you're going to go subside foot, I point towards the heart. You point towards the left shoulder and go to a 45 degree angle and suctioning through. You see this here is a alligator clip. 
you put that next to the needle and, um, and you hook it up to your EKG machine. And what will happen is that a normal EKG, the picture on the left, as you go in and actually hit the heart, you're going to create some findings of myocardial, uh, leave me alone, kind of yelling out, right? So you might actually get ST7 elevations or ST7 changes, depression, et cetera, because you're actually hurting the muscles. So you pull back a little bit until you get this again and you keep pulling your fluid. I don't think so. I, I, I would probably use one of the V leads just because those are the very good for QRS. Obviously, a, a, a right-sided one wouldn't be as good. You know, we want to use one of the lateral ones. Okay. And especially because you're kind of aiming towards the left and the left shoulder. So I think it's V4, V5, you substitute with one of those. Here's a video of a, of a pericardiocentesis. Now, guys, now, guys, the pericardiocentesis is recommended, recommended because it allows, because it allows direct, direct visualization of the pericardial effusion as, well as, as well as the needle use, use for drainage as it enters, as it enters the pericardium. If an ultrasound, if an ultrasound machine, machine is not available, electrocardiographic, electrocardiographic monitoring is recommended during the procedure to indicate, to indicate when the needle makes contact with the myocardium. A blind approach, a blind can, approach be can be attempted if either, either electrocardiographic monitoring or an ultrasound machine is immediately available. This approach, but this approach is often associated, associated with unacceptably, unacceptably high morbidity, morbidity and mortality as compared, as compared to one, to one that incorporates ultrasonography or electrocardiography. Use bedside, Use bedside ultrasonography to identify the pericardial effusion and to guide, and to your, guide your approach to emergency, emergency pericardiocentesis. Immediate the immediate subxiphoid approach to emergency pericardiocentesis begins just below the xiphoid process. Insert the spinal, insert the spinal needle, needle with the stylex in place to prevent dermal tissue from plugging the needle. Once the needle, once the needle has punctured the skin, the stylet, remove the stylet and, and attach a three-way stopcock in a 20 cc syringe. Advance the Advance needle, the toward, needle the toward the left shoulder, shoulder while aspirating continuously. The internal, the internal images presented here show the needle, show the needle the entering the thoracic cavity and advancing toward, toward the heart. After puncturing, After puncturing the pericardium, the needle, needle enters the space surrounding, surrounding the myocardium. Using real-time using real -time ultrasound, ultrasound images, guide the needle guide the towards the largest, towards the largest collection of pericardial fluid. fluid. Withdraw fluid, Withdraw from, fluid the from the pericardial effusion by aspirating with the syringe. Removing even, removing a, small even a small amount of fluid, fluid can lead to dramatic improvements in cardiac output, output, output and blood pressure. Once the needle, Once the needle is properly oriented, oriented, oriented to remove fluid, fluid easily, empty fluid from, empty fluid from the syringe by attaching tubing to a three-way stopcock. Continue to remove pericardial So we've talked uh, so far about um, what, uh, what injuries you expect, some of the complications related to it, some of the treatment, but what is next? Um, the 8% rule. Uh, different literature, different percentage, but about 8% of, of patients with um, severe uh, blunches trauma will end up undergoing surgery or operative repair. Here's some of those indications. Obviously, uh, a traumatic disruption of chest wall integrity. We talked about that flail chest, intubation, mechanical ventilation, but eventually that mechanically is going to result in other issues that are not going to be solved, so they need repair. They need actually repair the ribs. They put um, a plate and, and screws and so on. <coughs> Blunt diaphragmatic injuries, air massive leak following chest tube insertion. I remember one of the times I was taking a TLS. And I said, well, da, 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 the patient has a pneumothorax. I put a chest tube in, I hook it up, there's bubbles on it. The patient still has a tension pneumo. What do you do then? Right. So, the well, I check to make sure it's working well. It's working well, it's sucking air. Still has a tension, it's still hypotensive. And the answer was put a second chest tube in. So put it in a higher spot and put another one in because the, the air leak is so big that it's overwhelming what you can suck out. Um, so. If you have a pneumothorax that is no longer tension, but it keeps re-expanding, it doesn't re-expand alone because there's still air, then there might be a tracheobronchial injury causing a leak of air, basically recreating that pneumothorax. So that would be an indication to go in and fix it. A massive hemothorax, and that has two definitions. Either the, the amount you drain of blood when you first put the chest tube in is so much, or you get so much blood, like 250 mLs per hour for three consecutive hours. So uh, 800 cc's over three hours as a massive hemothorax. Uh, radiologic or endoscopically confirmed tracheal, major bronchial esophageal injury. And esophageal injury, sometimes through the chest tube, you get gastric contact. Something's not very good. The esophagus could have ruptured, stomach could have ruptured through a diaphragmatic hernia kind of thing. Um, when you, God forbid, when you put the chest tube, the patient had a traumatic uh, diaphragmatic hernia with stomach there, and you put it in the stomach, I mean, that could happen. 
uh, cardiac tamponade, so you try the pericardial TC, you drain some stuff out, but it's still hypertensive, you need a pericardial window, you need to go to the OR. And air embolism, either to the pulmonary artery or the heart. There is a controversial area and has been the ease of ED thoracotomy in patients with blunt trauma. Obviously, penetrating trauma, you can see the benefit. You know, you can, you know there's something there that puncture, the rupture, whatever. If you go in and clamp it or seal it, uh, then it should work. It still is very dismal results because we don't do it that often. Do you have the resources? I mean, if you're doing it, is it really going to work? And then on blunt trauma, the question is, what are you going to find? Um, and then we're going to discuss that just a little bit because that's uh, kind of why the whole presentation got done. But let's say you do. You need an emergency thoracotomy. So what you do is uh, an incision, kind of the same as we did with the chest tube, right under the nipple line, but it starts at the sternum, goes all the way down to the shoulder. I mean, it's a big incision, but that goes through skin and, and, and fat. Uh, once you see the muscle, you actually take scissors, and you puncture, and then you start cutting with the scissors from back all the way to the front. Once you got the scissors through and gain the entry into the thoracic cavity, then you use the hands to kind of spread a little bit. It's much harder than you would think. Those ribs are hard and try to push those out. I mean, that space is not even that big. I mean, your fingers, how do you even fit the fingers in to pull? It's really hard to do. But you have to pull enough so that you can put your, your mechanism, the, your rib spreader, and then start opening it up. It is horribly hard to do that. Um, but that's what's going to open up, and then you should start seeing lungs. The lung is beautiful inside, but it's squishy, right? It's like a big sponge. So you are not seeing your heart, which is what you want to get to, because it's something like this in blown trauma you're looking for. Is there a, a, an artery rupture, like an aorta rupture that I can clamp and, and seal? Is there a big pericardial tamponade and I can drain fluid out or open a pericardial window? The difference of pericardial window is basically a slit across the pericardium to let blood out and such. Um, or just do manual compressions and continue CPR, that matter. And once you gain access, then you got to find a way to kind of move the lung and keep it away so you can put your hand and get it all the way into the heart and so on. And then I'm going to play a really cool video. You can find this on uh, Dr. Melick's uh, channel. He's an emergency physician at a teaching facility in Augusta, Georgia, Dr. Hospital. Let's see. Let's 
So this was a, a successful editor economy. The question is successful in what sense? I mean, it could it come back anyway? Um, it doesn't sound like they really did anything. They already got the heart. They did manage to see some kind of artery bleeding that they clamped, and they actually got the patient back. Uh, but when they started doing it, they didn't have pulse, and, and they had already put, if you notice, a chest tube, and apparently it had so much blood that they determined that it was a, um, one of those indications, especially with loss of pulse. Um, of course, we don't know. I don't see any penetrating trauma, so they didn't know what it, uh, might have been a, a non-penetrating trauma. Um, nope, let me go back. So, um, oh, I thought I had that slide. So let's go back to our patient. Young patient, severe uh, trauma, was awake initially, or at least had vitals, and lost the vitals on the way here. They intubated, they were doing CPR, comes into the ER, and um, got fluid going. I think they gave medication and stuff, and compression is being done. The patient clearly had a flail chest. I mean, when you, they're doing compression, it was just, it, it, there was nothing in terms of uh, resistance and whatnot. Uh, one thing I would have liked to see in that case is needle decompression. Obviously, he lost uh, pulses. He was breathing and then stopped. He should have been <coughs> immediate needle decompression at that point. Um, I understand, you know, let's get it. Apparently, they were right off the exit here. Um, but that might have changed things a little bit. When I did the decompression on the right side, we did get blood right away. So I knew there was a hemothorax. So I did an emergency chest tube. Um, took no time. I mean, really very quick. You do the thing and you push it in, and you stab them, and we got a large amounts of blood. I mean, it literally squirted through the tube, down to the floor everywhere. And, um, but I had already decompressed both bones, so I had to go to the other side and also do a chest tube there. We didn't get much there either. Um, um, I mean, we didn't get much there in the other one we did. Uh, we continued CPR. This was a young patient. Um, didn't appear, uh, once we got the initial blood out, which was a lot, then it, it didn't appear to be doing anything else. We continued to do CPR and medications and fluids, and, and we weren't getting much. There was a little bit of PEA, you know, cardiac activity without a pulse. Um, we didn't know bedside ultrasound. There was a little bit of something. And I really thought that if anybody would come back, it was this patient. I, because we had time to get ready, I had already made arrangements to have an ED thoracotomy kit. I thought, this is the ideal patient to do it. I'm once. One, we already done everything we could do in the ER. Certainly, we're not going to hurt him by trying something. And if we manage to see a pericardial tamponade and open it up, or at least do manual compression that are more efficient, maybe we'll do something. And certainly enough, when we started doing the manual compression after doing the thoracotomy, um, we did manage to get him into V-fib, and then we shocked him. But then, of course, went into PA, like many codes do. And eventually, we called it. But there was a lot of questions. Of why do we open a chest? What do you do if you open it? And we wouldn't have cardiothoracic. It really doesn't matter. What if he would have regained a pulse? You just put a big gauze over it, you tape it, and you ship him elsewhere. You know, you stabilize the patient. So it doesn't really matter. Now, if you cross clamp an aorta, then yeah, sure, you need a cardiothoracic surgeon, and you need it very quick. But you can still ship him. At least you got something. The, the um, uh, what do you call it? Mortality is going to be very high. And the chance of survival are very, very low. But this was a young, healthy patient. We just might as well try something. Um, it wasn't anything like in those videos. It was very quiet. It was very controlled. We were all dressed up. There was no blood going up my arm or anything like that. And uh, I did need the assistance of a muscular nurse to rip those uh, ribs open and, and get in there. Um, so, questions? This is it, I think. And that's me in cartoon. <laughs> so we talk about a lot of cool stuff, you know, uh, not only the injuries, but the complications, some of the treatment, some videos, I like videos and multimedia and, and things you, you might or might not see in a sentence. For sure, as we become a trauma level three, we're going to start seeing some of those, definitely more chest tubes, um, uh, and so on. 
So questions about what we talk about? Yeah. Where are we in the progress of becoming a little free software? Jane. Yeah, as Jane was 